Language Advocacy Day Canada, February 4th, 2021. Hashtag LAD21. Keynote speech by Min Suk Lee. Min Suk Lee is an award-winning Canadian filmmaker, scholar, social justice advocate, and a groundbreaking artist with a diverse and prolific portfolio of multimedia work and films, as well as interdisciplinary background in labor, border politics, documentary, filmmaking, and video. In 2012, the May Works Festival of Working People and the Arts named Min Suk Lee Labor Arts Award in Lee's honor for her contribution to the cause of migrant workers. Lee is an associate professor at OCAD University with an area of research and practice focused on the critical intersections of art and social change in labor, border politics, migration, and social justice movement. We are so thrilled to have Min Suk as our keynote speaker. Welcome. Good morning. I hope you can hear me okay. Just give me a thumbs up so I, I know I'm transmitting across all the difficult lines we are managing and negotiating in the time of the pandemic. Awesome. So good morning. I'm joining you from Toronto, which has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. And the land that I live and work on uh, is the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation on the Shinabi, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and the Huron Indigenous peoples. And I carry out my work in my personal life committed to unsettling colonial systems of power so that we can build a country that respects indigenous self-determination and honors the treaties that we are all signatories to. And I'm very honored to speak to you today. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you. I'm gonna share with you some thoughts I have about how language is used in Canada's migrant worker programs. Um, to limit freedoms, to reinforce racist systems of exploitation, and also to build a national movement to change that. Language is power. A word can destroy you, your self-esteem, or it can make what seems impossible, an impossible dream, a reality. And this is true around the world, of course. If you can speak the dominant language of the society you live in, you can use words to advocate for your rights, participate in the decisions that affect your life, express your experiences to yourself and to others, and you can describe what happened to you and then organize with others to change the situation. Social change requires collective action. It's not an individual private moment, it's only possible to change our world through organizing with others who will understand each other and work towards a shared goal. Through my documentary work with migrant workers, I've seen firsthand how language is used as a tool to reinforce systems of exclusion, domination, and inequality in Canada. I've spent over two decades working with migrant workers allies who support migrant workers to fight for change. There are right now over half a million migrant workers in Canada, and they work in the essential jobs that Canadians don't want. And the people I'm talking about are classified as low skilled. And I put that in quotation marks because I don't think that there are any jobs really that are low skilled. I think there are low paying jobs, but I think that uh, all work requires uh, skill and the determination of low skill often reflects uh, very sexist and racist uh, devaluations of the work that uh, people do, uh, particularly work that women of color do. So most of the migrant workers that I'm talking about who are determined to be low skilled are black, brown, or racialized, and they come from countries in the global south whose own economies have been impoverished through the combined impact of colonialism, imperialism, and global capitalism. The work that migrants do in Canada is central to our economy. This country can't function without migrant workers. And I think for most Canadians, it was the pandemic, COVID-19, that first put a spotlight on our reliance on migrant workers in this country. As emergency measures were being introduced in the first lockdown, and think back to that first lockdown, it was only one year ago, 
it's hard to believe we're, we're meeting that anniversary right now, actually. Um, at the onset of the first lockdown, the federal government made exceptions on international uh, travel, international residents allowed entry into Canada. Exceptions were made for migrant workers almost immediately. That was one of the very first travel exceptions announced uh, because migrant workers were so central to our food systems and to our economy. But COVID also revealed another reality about migrant workers. The labor category is one which makes workers highly vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. And despite subsidies from the federal and provincial government, farmers and employers failed to protect migrant workers from the pandemic. There were COVID outbreaks in farms across Canada. Thousands of workers tested positive for the virus and in Ontario, three workers died. The known protections, physical distancing, you know, having the proper um, PPE, the, the protective equipment, those known protections controlled by employers cost money and require employers to value the lives of migrant workers. But I've seen workers treated as expendable. But their work that they perform is essential to every aspect of our lives. And so that's a contradiction that we hold in equal balance. Migrants in Canada work in farms. They work uh, as PSWs, personal support workers, cleaning um, you know, hotels, cleaning hospitals, butchering animals and slaughterhouses. These are all 3D jobs and we call them dirty, difficult and dangerous jobs. Working conditions are hard and there are many reports of abuse. They range from living conditions that are unsanitary or frankly unfit for humans uh, to non-payment of wages for work that's been completed to abusive treatment, racism, verbal assault or sometimes even physical assault. Workers are vulnerable to exploitation, not because they are essentially vulnerable, because there's something about them that's vulnerable, but because our laws set out vulnerable working conditions. Migrants are only permitted to work in Canada through closed work permits. And this means they, they're tied to one employer, which creates an extreme level of inequality between the boss and the worker. As a migrant in Canada, your job depends on whether or not your boss likes you or gives you a good performance rating. So your ability to advocate for yourself is compromised. If you speak out, you're out of a job. Sending workers back home is often a routine exercise to uh, get rid of workers who will speak out, who will push back and who will challenge um, bosses at the work site. So you speak out, you lose your job. And then I come to language. Now, the very first time I made a documentary uh, with migrant workers was back in 1999. And uh, back then, you know, more than two decades ago, I didn't know very much about migrant workers. I think I was like most Canadians. I thought migrant workers were a uh, problem in America. It was something that was, um, you know, a concern of Americans, but not something that uh, happened in Canada. And a friend of mine, Chris Ramsarup, who is an, an organizer for Justice for Migrant Workers, invited me on a bus that uh, he was organizing. And the bus was an information bus for those of us who worked in media and who were journalists. And Chris said to me, migrant workers are on strike in this town called Leamington, which is about four hours away from Toronto. And they're on strike because um, they're facing working conditions that are abusive. And he asked me to go on the bus uh, to find out what was happening. And at that time I hadn't made a documentary uh, of my own. I hadn't made um, or directed my own independent films, but I wanted to tell a story that uh, looked at you know, how labor rights were being fought for in communities that, um, that I could understand, communities that in which I could see a part of my own story in. 
So I went on that bus and when I arrived in Leamington, I was shocked. The people on the bus who were with me were journalists who worked in um, print media and in radio. And then um, there was myself. There weren't, we weren't, I think it was about 10 of us on the bus. It wasn't a large group. But one thing I noticed when we got off the bus was that all of the people who could speak Spanish were immediately surrounded by migrant workers. Now I tell you that when I got off the bus and arrived in Leamington, which is only four hours from Toronto, I was shocked. And the reason I was shocked was because I had never been to Leamington and we arrived on a Sunday afternoon and our bus uh, parked into the parking lot of a church and Spanish language services had just concluded. Migrant workers were in the parking lot and there were hundreds of migrant workers. Most of them were from Mexico or Central America. And what surprised me was that as soon as we got off the bus, anyone who spoke Spanish in our bus was immediately surrounded. Workers knew that they had someone that they could talk to, that they could share what was going on with them. And immediately workers were sharing stories of being exposed to pesticide and they were rolling up their arms and they were showing arms that were um, burned from you know, exposures to chemicals. Workers were talking about not being paid for work that they had done and asking about you know, the irregularities in their salaries. Workers were talking about living conditions, you know, overcrowded or that were you know, unsanitary. You know, they were um, living in bunkers that were unheated. And then workers also had contracts in their hands and they were asking about deductions and the rules and regulations of the contract. And this is the part that really struck me the most is that workers were in Canada under legal work permits um, beholden to a contract that they had signed but none of them could read those contracts. So all of the uh, people who I had traveled with were suddenly indispensable, were immediately um, facilitating information, giving information to workers about what their rights uh, were, what the responsibilities were as migrant workers, um, giving them information about how to access social programs. And it struck me that there was this large group of workers in Canada who were literally isolated from the very basic information that they need to access their rights. And I was really shocked that this was a reality in Canada because it was a side of Canada that I hadn't seen firsthand. You know, what's true about the vast majority of migrant workers in this country, over half a million, that they're bound to a contract that they can't read, to me, is about, that's a reality that speaks about systemic injustice. Bureaucracy itself defines this program. Forms, permits, applications, rules and regs, these are all relayed to workers mostly through their supervisors or private recruiters who routinely charge workers thousands of dollars in recruitment fees to secure a job in Canada. Now, technically the collection of recruitment fees is illegal, they sh that shouldn't happen. And yet this is a routine practice. The majority of migrants who work in Canada, many of them cannot speak English fluently without translation, we effectively deny them access to basic social services and channels to advocate for the, their labor and human rights. I remember talking to one worker uh, in the middle of the lockdown last summer he was working in a mushroom farm in Ontario and he had tested positive for COVID-19. He was isolating in a house that the employer had told him to stay in for two weeks. There were two other workers that he was sharing that house with. One of them was still working in the uh, mushroom farm and one also had COVID. He didn't know them. He was assigned to just live in that house. He didn't know what kind of supports he had access to. He didn't know 
whether or not he would be paid for the two weeks that he was isolating. He was essentially thrown into a pit of extreme vulnerability in the midst of an international pandemic. And he was afraid for his life. He had no information. And it was only when community members reached out to him to tell him you know, what he might be able to be eligible for in terms of income supports. That was the only kind of lifeline that he had. His employer wasn't providing that for him. The pandemic has turned meat plants into killing floors, not just for the animals that are routinely slaughtered, but terrifyingly for the workers. Three workers died at the Cargill meat processing plant in High River, Alberta, which reported 1,500 cases of COVID. And that was the largest single cluster in North America. And the second largest outbreak was at another meat packing plant, JBS Canada's beef facility in Alberta, where over 500 workers tested positive. Only nursing homes and prisons have been hit harder. What happens in these meat plants in Alberta has national significance because they alone make up 70% of Canada's beef processing capabilities. They're central to our food supply system. And at the onset of the first lockdown in mid-March 2020, agribusiness operators were deemed essential and the meat plants maintained regular hours to protect Canada's food supply chain, but workers were concerned. They were on the front lines. Everything that they heard about how the virus travels signaled alarms about their working conditions in meat plants. They're working long hours, they're working on sites that are unventilated and they're crowded. They're working in close quarters, elbow to elbow. And they're required to work really fast. The pace of production that's required of workers and meat plants is determined, the, the faster you work, the more profit the plant makes. And so there's a pressure to work as fast as possible. And the majority of workers in slaughterhouses are migrant workers in Canada under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. And the media reports and worker testimony about what happened last year at the Cargill slaughterhouse is deeply disturbing. You know, think back to your own experience of that first lockdown. How little you knew, how important it was for you to be able to access information immediately about what it was needed, what steps are needed to keep yourself safe. At that time, information was scarce. Even now, information is scarce. And although most workers in these meat plants spoke very little English, the company only provided information in English. The most common language spoken at the plant is Oromo, Tagalog, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Cantonese. The lack of clear information sowed utter confusion about accessing paid time off, compensation, isolation protocols. On the floor, management had face shields, but workers reported that they were not provided proper PPE, you know, proper protective equipment. They weren't provided masks, not able to practice social distancing protocols. The cafeterias and the locker rooms and the kill floors and assembly lines were crowded and they stayed crowded. Workers were packed against each other elbow to elbow. Nothing changed. And workers with symptoms were told they could continue working even if they had tested positive for COVID-19. That kind of information is misinformation is lethal. And workers say they were threatened with layoff if they weren't willing to work during the lockdown if they were physically able to work. At the height of the lockdown, the company incentivized workers to report for shifts by offering $500 bonuses for maintaining workplace attendance over eight consecutive weeks. So conditions didn't change and what seemed inevitable did happen. A worker died within weeks of the first lockdown being announced because she contracted COVID-19 at the plant.
Canadian laws create vulnerable conditions for migrant workers and change needs to happen. Advocacy is only possible when workers are advocating for themselves and the movement for change is informed directly by workers themselves. Workers who are working in vulnerable conditions need to be able to communicate with others to effectively advocate for their rights. And I think until recently, most Canadians claimed ignorance about and could genuinely claim ignorance about the presence of migrant workers in this country. Because in truth, most of us have actually never seen the work that migrant workers do. It's not on the front pages. Migrant workers are often employed in rural work sites that are far away from urban cores where the literal fruits of their labor are consumed. And if you live in a rural community, you might not see a worker because they're housed in accommodations in the farm that are purposely set far away from main roads and usually behind greenhouses. It's the act of unseeing which invisibilizes and silences the experiences and the lives of migrant workers. And by denying information to workers in their language, we're ensuring that workers continue to be exploited and abused. And the silencing ensures that one narrative is put out into the public record. And controlling the narrative is a form of power. Controlling the story is about controlling truths and asserting legitimacy to ways of knowing and ideologies. So I'm just gonna wrap up by saying that a modern nation state like Canada needs to, yes, celebrate you know, our history and our heritage, but we also work to deny our own history, deny acts of genocide, like the deliberate starvation of native people that laid the groundwork for the political construction of Canada. And now these stories are conveniently erased when people don't have access to the language to tell those stories or when the dominant narrative is controlled. So migrant workers are fighting for change and they're doing so by connecting with advocates outside of migrant worker communities. Their stories are getting out and making uh, a difference. A movement is growing across this country to change the conditions in which migrant workers live and work under. But it can only happen once we understand that the exploitation migrant workers experience is not happenstance, it's not random, it's not because of one bad apple who happens to be an abusive employer is because we have a system that regulates injustice and abuse. And it's anchored on language, on the fact that the vast majority of migrant workers in this country do not speak the dominant language, English. And therefore that ensures the silencing of their experiences. Thank you. See the video description below for a link to Minsuk's documentary, El Contrato. Language rights matter beyond the two official languages of Canada. Thank you, Minsuk. We could not do this without you. See you in 2022. Find us on your favorite social media. Email us at languageadvocacyday at gmail.com or visit languageadvocacyday.ca.